So today, uh, we're, we're going to finish Exodus 20 and get into Exodus 21. Last week, we looked at the Ten Commandments uh, pretty in depth. <coughs> and now as we go forward, what, uh, what the Lord is doing here up on Mount Sinai is he's giving, he's going to give, he's given the moral law and the Ten Commandments. Now he's going to, in the going forward in Exodus, he's going to give the civil law and the ceremonial law. And really those three things work in, in tandem because the moral law uh, sets up uh, the, the operations of uh, the, the civil law and the ceremonial law. So we'll expand that a little bit, uh, uh, and and we're gonna we're gonna dive into that. We're not gonna get we're gonna get to the end of chapter twenty one today. But I wanted to uh, just kind of look at the heart of the law uh, as we go forward. So let me pray before we get into the word. Father God, thankful to be in your word, thankful to be in fellowship uh, with uh, uh, just fellow believers, Lord. Uh, it's great for uh, us, all your kids, to gather together in uh, worship and fellowship. Lord, pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and help me, Lord, that you would teach every heart uh, what uh, each individual would have to learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, if you will remember, um, the, the, the law comes in uh, basically the two tables of the law. The first three commandments uh, that uh, you shall not, ha not have any gods before me, that you shall not uh, uh, make any idol for yourself, and that you should make the, uh, keep the Sabbath day and, uh, and keep the Sabbath day and make it holy. Those are the three things that uh, in the first table of the law pertain to your relationship with God. And then the second table of the law, the rest of the commandments, would be your horizontal relationships relationships with other human beings, right? So, so it starts with how you're supposed to interact with God and his holiness and his expectations in your relationship with him. And if that's squared away, you're always going to have better relationships with people people around you. And, and, and that would work, let's say you're in a situation and somebody does something to gall you or offend you. If you, instead of going right at that person and dealing with the situation, you go to prayer to the Lord and say, look, one of your image bearers has caused me trouble. And look at the first commandment that you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, look, your anger in that situation, your trial in that situation can become a God and an idol real quick. So if you start to pray about, okay, God, how am I supposed to handle this? God is going to settle you and give you great patience and, and confidence in how to handle that, right? And so so then you won't get into the other stuff, anger that leads to murder or whatever the thing is, uh, uh, covetousness, anything like that. So you see very practically how that works, uh, how that works out. And so what's happening here is God has said it that way. And he's, like I said, as he's going forward, he's going to give some practical application of how that works. So Starting here in verse 18, now Moses has been up on the mountain, he's come on Mount Sinai, and he's come down, he's uh, talked about the Ten Commandments, and in verse 18 it says this, all the people witnesses, witnessed the thunder and lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain surrounded by smoke. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a different distance. And he said, you speak to us and we will listen they said to Moses, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses responded to the people, don't be afraid for God has come to test you so that you will fear him and that you will not sin. And the people remained standing at a distance and Moses approached a total darkness where God was. So that first part, Mount Sinai the like, uh, like uh, clouds and darkness came over the mountain. Moses went up and got the law. He came down and he told this, and the people were afraid, right? They're terrified because they see this rumbling and they see what's going on. And, and their reaction is, oh my gosh. I, I think in some ways uh, they uh, don't let God speak to us or we'll die. I think at this point they are recognizing God's power and his holiness. It's kind of all come into focus, right? Remember, he's taken them out of Egypt every Every one of the plagues was to show them that he was above these false gods. Then he showed them the last plague, taking of the firstborn, that he had the power over life and death. He takes them into the wilderness, and they're basically stranded. 
they're basically stranded and there's no way out they're in a box canyon uh so canyon on either side of them and water in front of them he opens the red sea they pass and so now it's finally come into focus for them that look god is powerful He didn't have to rescue us. He has the power to end us. So when they see all this on the mountain, it's finally come into, and they're like, hey, Moses, be our advocate, because if we're up close with God in his holiness, after giving the law, we could die. It's dangerous for us. So, so in this, there's their fear and their understanding. Remember, they've cried about everything. He gave them manna. They cried. He gave them water. This is going to go forward. But <laughs> it's, it's kind of like us too, right? We see the glory of God sometimes, and then we're right back at it doing whatever whatever we'll do but this sets up uh this sets up to this is a picture in the bible there's picture and type now in the new testament it says there's timothy there's one mediator between god and man it is the man christ jesus so jesus is our mediator now not moses moses was a type he was the leader jesus has come and fulfilled the law he has fulfilled the law and now he's the mediator because he's brought us this holiness and righteousness that only God can give. It's pretty awesome, this picture that God gives us. So when he says that, God allows it and does that because he, obviously he's dictating us. But hey, they recognize God's holiness, their station, and that they need a mediator. And then it's interesting that Moses says that don't be afraid. God, is, God has come to test you so that you will fear him and you will not sin. And then in verse 21, this is his fifth ascent up the hill. He's going to go back up the hill and get what he's going to bring us going forward. And so the, the, the people may remain standing at a dark, in the darkness and Moses approached where God was. But look at this. This is interesting. He says, uh, and some people don't like this, don't be afraid because I've come to test you. Now, you might think, well, why would God give a test? What, what, what we, we, what's going on here? Why would God test his people? But if you remember, if you go back to uh, chapter 19, he says, you will be my people. You will be a people, uh, a, a royal priesthood, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. And they said, yes, we want that. So they've made a covenant. They didn't ask what the terms of the covenant were. And now God, through the Ten Commandments and going forward with the moral law and the civil law, God is giving them the terms of that covenant. And whether or not they're going to follow him is tested out right? And, and so you might think, well, why would God test this? But here, let me give you an example. When, when a couple gets married, you stand on the altar and you get married, and then you make this covenant with each other, you make this agreement with each other, and on the day you get married, y- y- you haven't really started to build a life together. But guess what? The first time that you have a car wreck or in the house, something breaks and you're fixing it and you're out of money, or the first time one of your kids does something that's off the rails, that covenant gets tested. Your marriage gets tested all the time. Sometime it might get tested because, I don't know about you fellas, but sometimes I say funny stuff because I'm pretty funny, and uh, it's, not, <laughs> it's, not always <laughs> it's not always received, and sometimes there's just a test because we're humans on earth and we're speaking to each other, Right? So, <laughs> right, you, you, you get what's happening here, uh, the, and your marriage gets tested all the time. Are you going to go back to the original covenant and the love you had for each other and remind you that and work it out in a godly way, the Ten Commandments, or are you going to spin off and you're going to walk away from that covenant and complain and be like, be like Adam, well, this woman you gave me, right? That's what Adam did. You know, he tried to blame God for that. Or are you going to handle it in a godly way, looking at the heart of the commandments? And so, so in that covenant and in that test, I wanted to take, and I touched on this last week, but I wanted to take some time and I wanted to, to just look, look with you guys. And, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn over here to this, but we're, we're going to Matthew chapter 5, because what Jesus says is, is important uh, about how he views this and what this covenant looks like for us. Okay, so you have the marriage illustration, but this is what Jesus says, and, and this is important, super important important because as Jesus fulfilled the law, 
is you look at the Old Testament, God does some things like uh, a couple of guys get killed at the at the at the front of the altar because they're giving strange fire. You see when when David and his crew is moving the 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 Ark of the Covenant improperly, and a guy goes to to touch it to save it, he dies because he doesn't do what God asks. Right? God takes sin very seriously. He punishes it to the fullest extent. And Jesus took that punishment. So this, this concept of holiness, sometimes we've lost in the American church. There's a, there's a concept out there called antinomianism. It's a big theological word. And basically what it means is that, that well, I believe, uh, if you were an antinomianist, that you would believe that God saved me, but his grace goes so far that I, can, I don't have to walk in holiness. I don't have to do, do all the things that the law requires because grace is going to go beyond whatever I do. So there's, it's almost like looking at your salvation as an insurance policy rather than a way to live. Right, and and Paul talks about this. He he uh, he combats this concept in in Romans. He asks, "Should we sin more so grace can abound more?" You don't want to have it in your mind that oh, I'm going to have a little sin in my life because it's all right. God died for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna ramble into some sin. That's not okay because Paul says, "May it never be." So looking at the heart of the law, here's what Jesus here's what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 12, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, and until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches other to do so and uh, do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does not, whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus does here is that he's talking about, like he's talking to his people and he's talking to the Pharisees, and what he's saying is, look, the Pharisees, they live this outward life, but their hearts are not in line with God. God, in the commandments, wants to not only have, he wants to have first your heart and your heart for him and heart for holiness, then behavior comes, right? Then the behavior modification comes. So he says, so Jesus, when he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but fulfill the law, he did that in several ways. He's all God. He's all man. He lived a perfect life. Perfect. Just imagine that. Every thought he ever had was perfect. Every action he ever had. He never, he never had that thought where you get mad at somebody and you're like, boy, I could, mm. never had that right? Perfect. So he fulfilled the law in that way. And then by extension, because he's perfect man and he's also God, he fulfilled the law when he died on the cross. The Bible says this, he, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin that you might know the righteousness of God. Think about that in the fulfillment of the law. Every sin If you have sinned once, it makes you a sinner in need of salvation. Every sin separates us in a relationship from God. You see one sin in the Garden of Eden. There's several of them there, but one sin separates you from God, and he kicks them out of the garden. That relationship is broken, right? But God said, I'm going to come and redeem my people. So when it says Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, every sin you ever sinned then was attributed to Jesus Christ, Imagine that. The God of the universe loved you so much that he came down here to live in this mess and took all of your sins upon him. A holy God who couldn't even be near sin, he had to separate people, became sin. Your sin became his sin. He took it from you, took it upon himself, and then in return, he handed you his holiness. That's when we die, when we get to heaven. Everybody has the judgment, and in our flesh, 
we're we're going to be separated from God in hell. It was created it was created for for the the devils and stuff, not for us. But since we sinned, it was already there available. But think about that: when you step into heaven, God is not going to see your sin. He is going to see the righteousness of God because Jesus now owns your sin, and your righteousness has been given to Jesus, or Jesus's righteousness has been given to you. That's amazing. So when Jesus says he came to fulfill the law, he lived it perfectly, took on your sin, and gave you his righteousness. Every punishment for the law Jesus took, fulfilled it all. Because God has to crush sin. God had to do that to Jesus for our sin to be taken care of. Because it's not like God swept it under the rug. It had to be punished. And so when we look at that, Every part of the law was fulfilled. Your righteousness that has to get to you in heaven came from Jesus. But then he goes on and he says, hey, look, um, whoever breaks one of these, and this is why it's important to understand that, that we don't want to as believers, we're going to sin, right? But we don't want to take it lightly just because like, uh, God did that for us and we can live however we want. Not only that, in addition to that, how we live, we should have a heart to God that says, every time I do ill, I want to turn to you, Lord, remember that forgiveness and not do that anymore. Right? And so he says, Whoever breaks the least of these commandments and teaches other to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And I don't even know how that works because it, it, heaven is hard to imagine. But just imagine that, hey, look, if by your actions, your words, your example, you lead other people into sin because you're not as a believer trying to be holy like your father in heaven is holy, you're teaching other people by your example by your leadership, by our leadership, right? There, there's qualifications of elders and deacons that should be the, the leadership in the church, but it's also for all believers. That's in Timothy and Titus. And when we look at the law here, when we go on and see what, what Jesus is going to say about lust just looking or hate starting in your heart, it's not that just like the Pharisees, we try to have good behavior, but we also try to have good that that we not try to have the thoughts we have a friend uh who's in construction and sometimes they say um lots of things in construction like swear words and and the like and uh he's trying to not do that and his wife keeps telling him third thing whatever you say don't don't say the first thing that comes to mind don't say the second thing that comes to mind think it through and say the third thing that comes to mind it should be a little bit holier right and so there's the heart behind that that is like i'm going to stop myself from saying the first thing out of my mouth and the second and by the time i get to the third i should not only not be thinking the thing i'm going to say I should not say it, but I shouldn't be thinking it because if I stop and think about what I'm going to say, I'm going to turn to God and be a little bit more holy in what I say, right? It's also a, it's also a good rule if you're trying to be funny or something because, you know, not everybody. <laughs> so, it, so the heart of the law is not just behavior modification, but it is to not think the nasty thing that you're about to say. Thoughts become words, words become actions. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And so the heart of the law, what he's saying is here, is that to not teach others, you, to not be the least in the kingdom of heaven, you should be having your thoughts pure so it doesn't come out of your mouth. Because you can do some behavior modification for a while, but it's only a while before that dam breaks and you're going to say whatever's on your mind or do whatever's on your mind, right? (coughs) But... Whoever does and teaches these commands will be great in the kingdom of heaven, right? And then he's going to go, so so then he's going to expound on that. And we're going to look at these again. I know we touched on it last week, but he says, you have heard that it was said, this is going on in Matthew 25 and verse 21, you have heard it said that our ancestors do not murder. Whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever... um, And whatever uh, suits his brother or sister will be subject to in the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift from the altar, go first and be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Reach 
uh, on a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way to him, uh, to the court, so uh, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So what God is saying in do not murder, again, thoughts become words, words become actions. The heart of the law, love the Lord your God, don't have idols before me, is that so your anger doesn't come, uh, your anger doesn't come in your relationship between you and God. Because just think about it, when we're angry at people, there's a lot of selfishness in this. You're angry at somebody and I want to punish them, right? How fights break out, how murder happens, right? It's usually what they call a crime of passion. Well, that passion started in the heart a long time before the action happened. So what Jesus is saying here is that in your heart, in your heart, you should not be where you're at. You should not be even thinking about your anger because in that, uh, just think about this. Sometimes in our anger, we look at other people and we're like, man, that person deserves punishment. And we hold on to our anger because we want to punish. Why? We want to be the arbiter of punishment. Are you letting the Lord your God do his work? Are you, have you become your idol? Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. When you get angry and you want to and you want to do things to somebody, what you're saying is, God, you're not capable, you're not, you're not big enough to, to take care of this other person's sin. I got to do it my own self. You've just become your own God and you've just become the arbiter of righteousness. See how that works? And then the ultimate act of taking somebody's life, right? Then you've become the judge of life and death. Just like God in, God in, the, in the Passover when he took the firstborn. See how that works? So when you're angry, you're taking over God's role. I can be angry with this person because I'm the arbiter and judge right? So God says, just look at Jesus' example. He's on the cross dying for these people's sin, and he looks down at them and he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's real tough. But that's the holiness that God wants us to have. It's the freedom he wants us to experience because forgiveness is real hard, right? Not having that murderous thought or that angry thought or that person needs punishment in your heart, that's real hard because in forgiveness, Sometimes we equate that to agreeing with what that person did was okay. That's not how that works. Forgiveness says, I know you did something wrong. Just like Jesus says, I became sin. Jesus fulfilled the law, right? We don't have to do that. So when you forgive, when God says, have this heart towards other people, it sets us free to be loving and pray and give God the room to do whatever he's going to do with that person. And we should be the person we're angry at. Like it's saying in Matthew here, we should be trying to restore or, or at, least, uh, at least get forgiveness and some sort of agreement with that person. So when it comes down to judgment day, you're not carrying into ultimate judgment this hate and discontent with another person. Right? Our lives could be demanded of us at any time. Do you want to stand before the Lord and be lesser in the kingdom of heaven because you've got anger and discontent and unforgiveness towards a person? I get that. It's hard, right? It's a hard thing to say because we do want that. We do want to have control over the punishment of another person. But you have to think of it in the bigger term. Can you forgive? Can you forgive that person to be holy like your Father in heaven? That's real hard real hard but that's the heart of the law that's the heart of the law that's what god's saying so and and then he goes on it's the same it's the same in adultery you have heard it said do not commit adultery but i tell you everyone who looks on a woman lustfully already has committed adultery with her in his heart if your right eye causes you to sin gouge it out and throw it away for it is better to lose parts of your body rather than the whole body be thrown into hell and your right hand causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away for it is better for you to lose the parts of your body than your whole body to go into hell serious business god takes sin seriously and this is a tough one like and and this is not okay this is in the um uh everyone who who looks at a woman woman lustfully this could be men this could be women in our day and age lust is lust right it, whether you're a man looking at a woman a woman looking at a man man looking at a man however that goes god has said you should have purity right when he's talking about the heart of the law and he's going to test you look fellas this world tests us all the time 
and just to have that thought, it's not like, okay, I recognize something and look away. It's that second look. It's that right click. It's where you let your mind go in the conversation or the flirtation, right? And so what God is saying is like, not only do not have the action, but the world says, hey, you can, if you're married, you can look at the menu, but you can't eat. It says you can right click. It's in the privacy of your own home. You can see whatever's on that screen. But the Lord says all of that, all of that is sin and thoughts become words, words become actions, and sooner or later you're in an adulterous situation, whether you're at home with a computer and it's, it's, it's masturbation or whatever, or whether you're having a, an affair with a coworker. That's how it happens, right? And God says you can't do that. Right. And, and that's a, another hard thing because we look at it. Look, this sex, what God has given us is a thing that God has given us for marriage and for for marriage to be good and holy. And, 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 and what the God is saying is what God is saying in this in the heart of the law. Not only do I want you to be holy because I'm holy, but in the holiness, guess what? If you're holy like God and you're not out there doing those things, you don't damage a relationship. Right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 says that sexual sin is a sin against your own body. And you see all the things that are out there in society where it's come. There's disease. Hey, if you, if, if, if as we teach our kids and as, we, as we're going through this as kids, hey, look, you never have to worry about unplanned pregnancy. You never have to worry about disease. You never have to worry about guilt. You never have to worry about keeping secrets. If you wait till marriage, it's all good. It's okay. That relationship within the bounds of marriage, you can, it's there for your good, right? But anything that God has given us good, taken out of that context, turns bad. So, so expounding on the law, back to the Ten Commandments, when God says, you shall not commit adultery, it's not because God doesn't want us to have any fun. It's because he's given us a thing that is supposed to be good and healthy in our marriage, and the world has said, no, nah, it's not that important. God has said, it's holy. Your marriage is holy. Because it's given for God. So, so again, in the context of the heart of the law, as he goes through, and we're going to see going forward in verse tw chapter 21, all that, uh, all that works. And again, in verse 33, still in Matthew, again, you have heard it said that it was said of our ancestors, you must, uh, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven because, uh, because of the throne or because of the earth or because of the footstool or Jerusalem or because the city, uh, uh, there was a great king. king. Do not swear by uh, uh, your head because you cannot make a single hair on your head, white or black. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than that, uh, th this is from uh, this is from the evil one, and so when you're when he's talking about that in the later commandments, covet covetousness, and even to the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no no uh, idols before me. Look, the heart of the law is if if we're making a commitment to somebody, and you say I swear by the Bible, or you make a a, a swear about something, you know, or or, or a, an agreement about something. You shouldn't use anything else God's name because this would be taking the Lord's name in vain. If you say, hey, by the Lord, I'm going to do this, and then you fail, uh-oh. Maybe you should think it through before you make, make that thing. And God is saying even further than that, don't use my name to make an agreement. Just make an agreement by saying, yes, I can do that or no. Because if you don't, make, because if you don't think it through in the heart of the law, how does that break your relationship with God? If you have committed to do something for somebody else, you need to make that commitment, right? And so if you can't make the commitment, it's better to tell a person, oh, I can't do that. And the Pharisees at that time made all kinds of commitments and swore by the temple, and it was a whole big deal, but it was just a shell game, right? Because they were still sinful, and they were trying to look perfect. So what God's saying in the heart of the law is, hey, don't swear by na my name. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain by making commitments you can't keep or swearing by God and saying that, that you haven't done the right thing. And then even harder, going on in verse 38 in Matthew 5, you have heard it said that there's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, you do not resist the evildoer. Uh, uh, on the contrary, if anyone slaps your right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for one who wants uh, one to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. For if anyone forces you to go a mile with him, go too. 
Give, uh, give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Well, so this is real hard because it's going to go into an eye for an eye, right, in the Old Testament, and that was to hold back sin. But the heart of the law is like, hey, look, if somebody sins against you with their hand and you have the opportunity to testify and get their hand cut off, well, first of all, you as the sinner are probably not going to do that thing. Hey, if I got caught for stealing and they're going to cut my hand off, I should probably not steal, right? You should probably have the heart. That, that law should turn you back to heart of the law that I should not covet, right? But then if you're the lawgiver, you can also say, hey, I can give grace, right? But it's, it's a big deal. This is, this is how, like, you know, under, under lust it said, hey, cut your right hand off, cut your eye off. If it makes you sin, an eye for an eye. God's making it this important because he wants us to know both how seriously he takes sin and that we can be the arbiters of grace, right? And if somebody strikes you back, you have the ability to strike them back, an eye for an eye. But what if instead of that, you're like, you know what? You just hit the other side too. This is counter to everything as free American men that I can understand, right? It makes no sense because if somebody hits me in the face, win, lose, or draw, I'm going to make a day of it having a, having a, having a Donnybrook with that guy, right? Pack a lunch because we're going to go at it. Uh, well, at least when I was a young man. Now I don't think I'd do that. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's, that's our thought, right? So, so everything that's in holiness is sometimes antithetical to how we think and feel. So all that back, going back to uh, the additional laws that he's going to give here in, uh, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 21, finishing up in 20, right? So, so all that to expand on the heart of the law. So when we go through the law, you're going to see, see how that works. And so this is back in Exodus in chapter 20 in verse 22. Then the Lord told Moses, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. You have said that it was spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods, uh, do not make gods of silver or gold to, to uh, rival me. Do not make gold uh, for yourselves. Make uh, an earthen altar for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings and your flocks and your herds, and I will come to you and bless you in in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. If you make a stone altar for me, do not build it out of cut stones. If you use a chisel on it, you will defile it. Do not go up to the altar on the steps so that your nakedness uh, is not exposed on it. These are the ordinances. Uh, these are the ordinances that you are to set before them. So what God is saying there is, "Hey, look, I've spoken to you from heaven again." I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Don't make any have any other gods before me, and uh, don't don't make gods of silver uh, silver for yourself. And remember, in the timeline, we're not far away from those guys making a golden calf, right? Right now, they're having this moment at the foot of the hill, but they're going to forget. But then, what it says is, hey, uh, when you make an altar, do not make it out of cut stones. Don't chisel them and don't defile it. So here's what God is saying: if you if you have a guy chisel on that, because we're humans, we're going to look at those sorts of things and we're going to say, man, that's beautiful. And you're going to start thinking about the beautiful carving and maybe you're like, oh, now, now I'm thinking about the carver, not the, not the stone that was made by God, right? And so when God says that, he's saying, hey, I made the rocks and stones. I made them smooth. Make the altar out of what I, what I made. Make it simple so you can worship me, not something made by human hands. And then he puts this weird thing. Do not go up uh, the altar of the steps so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. So what he's saying there is not, not like, like these guys wear tunics and they don't, I don't think they had under drawers like we do. So if you're up high, somebody could look up your skirt or your tunic. That's not what he's, that's not what he's saying. But if, if you look even forward to Paul's time, there's a lot of pagan religions that have uh, sexual uh, uh, parts of their, parts of their uh, ceremony are actually public sexual uh, things. They had temple prostitutes, and part of the priest would actually perform sexual acts in, in public where people could see it, right? So what he's saying is the pagans do this sort of thing. They do this sort of sexual ritual publicly, and he's saying, don't do that. That's dirty, right? 
Just just think think about our world. We you know our world's bad. We've seen some things, but thinking about think about going to a thing where there's just public live porn going on. That's basically what was happening in their in their temple offering, and that's what he's saying here. Don't do that. It defiles everything. Right, and you see throughout throughout the children of Israel, you see into numbers where, like even uh, Balaam, you know, the king hires him to try to go and and speak curses against the children of Israel, and he and Balaam can't do it. So so Balaam's like, well, just bring your girls down, and they'll that'll distract them, then they'll get into idolatry. Right, this is why God has told them, don't get into this. This is this is a bad deal if you get into this. So so then. In, in, in chapter 21, it goes into this, laws about slaves. So before, before I read this section, it, just think about this. With human nature and the heart behind the law, it really, the law really is powerless to change people's hearts. It's got to be God's heart behind the law and his gospel that has to change hearts. The law is set before us to point us to the gospel. Not everybody's going to do that. But the law he put in place, because humans are humans, sometimes people will ramble right through, right through the law unless they're setting up because that's how the human heart is. But he puts this law in place because not everybody is going to take the heart of the law and do it. So he sets these laws in place knowing that, the civil law, so make sure that people who aren't going to follow the law have training wheels in place and it it now he's he's looking forward from the 10 commandments and putting them in the civil law to basically give training wheels to the law so people can look at something and so oh I shouldn't do that instead of praying to God they they need it written down <laughs> right it puts it in there for protection so it starts in chapter 21 with laws about slaves when you buy a hebrew slave he is to serve for 6 years then on the 7th year he is to leave a free man without paying anything. If he arrives alone, he is to leave alone. If he arrives with a wife, his wife will leave with him. If the master gives him a wife and she bears sons and daughters, the wife and her children belong to the master and the man is to leave alone. But if the slave declares, I love my master, uh, my master, my wife, and my children, but I do not want to leave as a free man, his master will bring him to the, judge, uh, to the judges, then he will bring him to the door, doorpost, and the master will pierce his ear with an awl, and he will serve his master for life. So, slaves, slaves in the Bible. This is tough, because slavery is bad. So uh, a lot of people say that this is all, all the slavery in the Bible is talking about indentured servitude. Some of it is. This pasture, passage right here is talking about this, a Hebrew slave. There's other forms of slavery around. Remember, this is some 430 years before this. Joseph is sold into slavery, slavery, real slavery, by his brothers. Both exists. So when we look at this, remember, the heart of the law is God is saying, I'm not okay with slavery. But he says, because people will not follow the law, I'm putting in place things so that with people do have slaves or indentured servitudes that they treat them right. This is one of those examples like like in the time of the judges, the children of Israel say, hey, we want a king. We want a king. And God's like, I am your king. And they're not low. Like all the other kids, we want a king. So God's like, all right, I'm going to give you a king. But you're going to get what kings bring with them and you're going to it's not going to work out great, right? So God understands that humans are, humans are sinful. They're going to do what they're going to do. So because of that, God is not condoning sin, but he's saying to people who have slaves or indentured servitudes, you better get it right because everybody's created my image and the person working in your house has created my image. You better treat them accordingly. You shall not murder. You shall not have this bad thought against your slave so so as it goes through this uh this also this would first part would be more like an indentured servitude you hire somebody they're in your house for six years and on year of jubilee they get to go free that's how it works you know uh and and we'll get into that more of that later but that's how it works so you're basically you signed a six-year employment contract and so it says the same sort of thing hey if if he comes with a wife she gets to leave but if you're a slave and you get a wife from your master, you have to know at that point, do I like my master well enough to take this wife to fulfill my agreement to my master and to my wife? 
because at the end of six years, I can leave, but my, if my wife has come from the master, I need to stay. And so at that time, look, if, if right, the heart of the law, you've got to look at that as a slave who's in this, or, or a servant who's in this con- making this contract. Will your yes be yes? Will your no be no? Because if you make a commitment to your wife and you get married, and at the end of seven years you bail, well, when you tested that marriage vow, you were, it wasn't willing to be tested. You can't leave with your freedom and leave your wife behind. And if your master's not good, you should have thought about taking that wife before that, right? That's how the heart of the law works. But there's also a picture in this because Paul says, I'm a bondservant of Christ. He could have had his freedom to continue what he was doing, but but but. Paul says the same thing. I'm a bondservant. I don't want my freedom. I want my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he calls himself, this is a bondservant, this is what it means. Working for my master is better than the freedom I could have in sin. That's the picture that he puts up here with this slavery. Because you know what? Everybody serves a master. Freedom can be your master. But the freedom in Christ is something else, isn't it? Something something better. So when, when, when he puts us in there, not only is it protection for the slaves, but it gives us this picture of, huh, I could have my freedom in sin. Sure is better to be with Jesus. I'm going to be a bondservant. And then he goes on in verse 7 of uh, Exodus 21. When a man sells his daughter as a concubine, she is not to leave uh, as male servants do. She is to, <coughs> if she is displeasing to her master who chose her, for himself he must let her be redeemed he has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously towards her or if he chooses her for his son he must deal with her accordingly to the customary uh, treatment of daughters if he takes an additional wife he must not reduce her food clothing or marital rights of the first wife and if he does not Do these three things for her. She may leave free of charge without any payment. Well, this is weird. Because a man sells his daughter as a concubine. So this is difficult because I can't imagine in that situation that uh, no matter how poor I was, I don't think I'd sell my daughter, right? It's just not how that works. However, if, if, if you look at this in the context if people were poor and you could sell your daughter and you basically receive a dowry, she would be better taken care of. And I think that's the thinking. Here's the other picture in that. When, uh, when you have daughters, the biblical picture is my daughter is under my protection until the day I walk her down the aisle and hand her to a man that I think is worthy to take care of her mentally spiritually, physically, and I'm not going to do that until I can place, until I know that a man, a young man, is, is worthy of having my daughter, right? And so that's the thing. Bible gives, God gives protection to the women. And unfortunately, sometimes women were looked at lesser people. That's how it was looked at, but uh, looked at a lot of times in the society, but God didn't want it that way because women and men are equal different roles but knowing how people are god is providing protection for this women but for for women but but the ultimate true picture is that protection of a good benevolent father who walks his daughter down the aisle for another good god-fearing benevolent man right that's how it's supposed to work so so if he sells his daughter as a concubine that doesn't sit well with me but that's how it was he gives her some protection so if all of a sudden that this man has sold his daughter as a concubine, and this guy's like, yeah, I don't like her very much anymore. It puts protection in so this guy can't just treat her poorly and send her away. So it means then she can be redeemed. That means her family can come back and redeem her and buy her back, get that dowry back, uh, or exchange money, whatever, and be back under the protection of, of that. He can't just kick her out and say, good luck with that. Because women couldn't earn, they didn't have that sort of thing like we do. This is protection for these women. Then uh, he has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously towards her, right? So now remember, all this is good that the seven elders that Moses has had, if these things happen, these guys can then adjudicate this with this. And if he mistreats this woman, 
he's treated him treacherously and he's under the penalty of law, whoever buys her. Or if he chooses her for his sons, he must deal with her accordingly to the treatment of daughters. So then if he purchases this woman and he wants her to marry, and, and the man wants him, this woman to marry her, his son, he has to give the dowry. And the dowry is this. It is alimony in advance. So if, if this man changes his mind and sets her free or he dies, that woman is protected and taken care of financially if she's a widow. That's what the dowry is for. That's why a man has to go out and work and set up life and, and be able to provide for his wife. And it used to be that you have to pay the father. That way, if you died or bailed, the father then has the wherewithal to take care of his daughter with that money that you've provided before you got married. Right? Protection. God doesn't like slavery and all this stuff, but he's providing protection. And if he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce food and clothing or marital rights for the first wife. Again, marriage is between one man and one woman. People didn't pay attention to that. So God's put in place, hey, look, if you guys are sinning like that and you have this wife or she's a concubine and you get another one, you can't treat her poorly because you got a new girl. That's not how that works. You have to maintain and take care of her. All the way down for the rights of the first, first wife, conjugal rights. And, uh, that, uh, so, so, and then if it breaks down all together, there in verse 11, and if he does not do all these three things for her, she may leave free of charge without any payment. She wouldn't have to buy her freedom. So you see how that works going through all that to have the heart of the law. And when, then when you look at this thing about slaves, you're like, why does the Bible condone slavery? It doesn't. It doesn't condone having multiple wives. But God, knowing that the law is not going to keep people from sinning, puts these protections in to protect people from the predation and sin of other human beings who are not trying to live holy towards the law. So we as people, as we look at this, we want to be people who are doing what God wants, not looking at the punishment that would come, that could come, but looking to our close relationship with, a uh, close relationship with Christ and how that should work out with him, that solves all the problems in our horizontal relationships with other people. Or it should. <laughs> and sometimes it takes time and it takes patience, but but the heart of the law. And as we go forward next week, uh, looking at all these other laws, be thinking about that, be looking at it this week, and be examining your life. Is my heart in line with the law of God? And where I'm out of place, do I know that God is going to change my heart if I ask him that he's put people around me to help me with that and that do I love the Lord and want to live in a holy heart fashion so that my outward life looks like it should according to the Lord because my heart's right that's the question amen father God uh, thank you for your word Lord uh, just found uh, working through the law very challenging this week Lord but uh, uh, your heart is for us Lord and your heart is for us to be holy like you. Lord, you, you gave us yourself to, to make us holy, and, and, and that came for free, Lord. But as we work through the things in our lives, I pray that we would rely on you, that we would be in your word every day so that we would be more like you, Lord. That, uh, uh, and in this world that, uh, obviously, as we've seen, that uh, has the same sin that's been around since, since Genesis 3, Lord, that we would be people in this world that are living in a way that other people would see our heart our love for you, our love for your holiness, and that because of that, we would be people who would stand out and shine in this world and other people would ask us why we live like we do and why we love like we do. Lord, we hope and pray that we each would do that. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.